The entire money-structured and materialistic-oriented society is a false society. Our society will go down in history as the lowest development in man. We have the brains, the know-how, the technology, and the feasibility to build an entirely new civilization. It was living through the 1929 Great Depression that helped shape my social conscience. During this time, I realized the Earth was still in the same place. Manufacturing plants were still intact, and resources were still there, but people didn't have the money to buy the products. I felt the rules of the game we play by were obsolete and insufficient. Misery, suffering, and war provided the incentive for my life's work. I was also motivated by the seeming incompetence of governments, the academic world, and the lack of solutions offered by scientists. I realized instead of working with individuals, a more effective method would be to redesign the culture. This began a lifelong quest to finding solutions to the many problems that we have today. This presentation is a feasible plan for social change that works toward a peaceful and sustainable global civilization where human beings, technology, and nature coexist. It outlines an alternative to strive for, where human rights are not only paper proclamations, but a way of life. It is called the Venus Project. Its founder, Jacques Fresco, calls for a straightforward redesign of the culture in which war, poverty, hunger, debt, and unnecessary human suffering are viewed not only as avoidable, but totally unacceptable. It is becoming increasingly obvious that anything less will simply result in a continuation of the same problems we face today. The Venus Project's research center, constructed by Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, is located in Venus, Florida. It addresses many of the root causes of our difficulties. But what are the real origins of our problems? At present, we are left with very few alternatives since we're on a collision course of our own making. Answers from yesterday are no longer relevant. Considering the damage already done to the environment, we are rapidly approaching a point of no return where nature will dictate the course. Either we continue as we have with outmoded social customs and habits of thought, thereby threatening our future, or we apply a more appropriate set of values, relevant to a sustainable society, with more opportunity and freedoms. Americans have been conditioned in, a, in their kind of society to get a different kind of car next year, to buy a new television set or a tape recorder. We are radical as hell, but our political and social institutions have not changed. And this is where we are stagnating, because we always equate, equate any new idea with communism or regimentation because we've been brought up to fear that which is new. None of the world's economic systems, socialism, communism, fascism, or the free enterprise system have eliminated the problems of elitism, nationalism, racism, and most of all, scarcity. These are all based primarily on economic disparity. When money is used to regulate and distribute resources for profit, and people and nations are out for themselves, they will seek advantage at any cost. They do this by maintaining a competitive edge, 
or through military intervention. War represents the supreme failure of nations to resolve their differences. From a strictly pragmatic standpoint, it is the most inefficient waste of lives and resources ever conceived. Most wars are for the control of resources and maintaining your position of differential advantage. They're not based on the dignity of man, they're not based on elevating human beings. It might elevate the human beings in the country that's the victor. It might do that. But for the, as far as the rest of the world goes, the price is enormous. This crude and violent attempt to resolve international differences takes on even more ominous overtones with the advent of computerized nuclear delivery systems and deadly biological and chemical weapons. Yet it is a windfall money-making opportunity for those who profit by the military-industrial complex. If the profit were taken out of wars, do you really believe we would have them? If they draft you into the army to serve this country, you put up your life for this country, they should draft all the war industries. Every cannon maker, machine gun maker, automobiles, jeeps, warships, all drafted. So on the same basis of pay as the army, then it's real. But if you make millions selling warships, machine guns to the army, then it's corrupt. I would, if I had my way, if we had millions of men in the army, I'd send them to school to become problem solvers. How to get along with other nations. That's what we have to do, not kill. When soldiers are just killing machines, they're trained to kill. I would train them to be able to go to Mexico and bridge the difference and go to the Arab world see if they can bridge the difference. So bring them all together, all the nations. War is not the only form of violence imposed upon people. There is also hunger, poverty, homelessness, and unemployment. The acceptance of these conditions as expressive of human nature is a myth used to keep things as they are. Genetics has nothing to do with greed, business, race prejudice. All of the operant systems in any society are part of your education, the books you read, the role models you follow, and the people you admire. The genes have nothing to do except with the color of your eyes, the shape of your nose, perhaps inherited features. The genes do not control values. And even if you're born with a much better brain than another person, meaning better receptors, the quality of the tissue is better, I would say that if you have a better brain and you live in a fascist country, you become a fascist faster. The brain has no mechanism of discrimination. The brain can't tell you what is relevant or less relevant, except experience. We are not born with greed, envy, hatred, or bigotry. Our behavior and values are reflective of the culture we are exposed to. If you were raised by the headhunters of the Amazon, you'd be a headhunter. And if I said to you, doesn't it bother you to have five shrunken heads? You say, yes, my brother has 20. <laughs> so, is he nuts? No, that's normal to his culture. Social and environmental problems will remain insurmountable as long as few nations control most of the Earth's resources and the bottom line is profit over the well-being of people. Putting profit first results in unnecessary suffering and aberrant behavior prevalent today. Many people feel that we need the rule of law to eliminate our problems. We have many laws, thousands upon thousands of them, but they are constantly being broken. Paper proclamations and treaties do not alter the facts of scarcity, deprivation and insecurity. You can predict the shape of the future and the values if you know the trends of events in the ocean pollution, the scarcity of arable land. If you watch that degrading system grow, I can predict 
the riots and killing and assassination. In other words, human behavior is really generated by the surrounding environment. If there's a scarcity, say, of water, it is prized, and its price is high. Let's discuss scarcity as a system. Suppose it rained gold for about three days, gold dust. People would go out and shovel it in, fill the cellars, the attic, every drawer out, they'd throw out their clothing. If the rain kept up for a year, so the gold was all over the place, people would sweep it out of the house, take their rings off, throw them away, and so human behavior and it goes, change to that condition. There's only a, a policeman in front of something that people have need for and don't have access to. So you put a guard there. But if lemon trees or orange trees and apple trees grew all over the place, you couldn't sell it. If you landed on an island that was so abundant with resources, you had 10 people, there were a thousand fish for every person if you wanted it. There were 10 times the amount of bread, fruit, and bananas. Money would not come into existence. Private property would not come into existence. If the island was big enough, there were 10 people, there were 8,000 acres. No one would give a damn about staking out this particular area. There are patterns of behavior that promote survival. There are social conditions that change our values and outlook. No one can write a constitution of required behavior without consulting the environment. So we'd better take care of the environment, we'd better take care of one another, and we'd better educate people to the highest possible levels of our ability in order to have a society. Even a peace treaty cannot prevent another war. The underlying causes are not dealt with. Maybe what is needed are ethical people in government who will work towards everyone's well-being. But even if the most ethical people were elected to high positions and we ran out of resources, there would still be lying, cheating, stealing, and corruption. It's not ethical people that are needed but rather a way of intelligently managing the Earth's resources for everyone's well-being. Let's examine our social arrangements further. To maintain our economy, products must continuously be sold. To assure this, they are deliberately designed to wear out and break down. Maybe you've noticed this usually happens right after the warranty expires. This corrupt practice is referred to as planned obsolescence, which is the conscious withdrawal of efficiency. Innovators go through the finest schools and then are required to design things that wear out and break down right on schedule. This results in a tremendous waste of resources and energy. We are plundering the planet for profits. If you think about it, it isn't a job people want, but access to what their paycheck will bring. Money does not represent anything real, and there's no gold, silver, or resource to back it up. You can't eat money or build a house of it. It's not even related to our real capacity to produce goods and services on this planet. The monetary system has been handed down from centuries ago, and we continue to use it without questions. This system will keep installing more and more automation, cutting down on the purchasing power of the majority of people. There will come a time called the Gaussian curve, where employment is that, production is this, and purchasing power is that. The system stops. Banks fail, nothing works anymore. We're moving in that direction very rapidly. We have finally gotten to a place in 2011 where it's becoming obvious that the machine has beaten the man. We're, incre I, I, we're I, incredibly productive with far fewer We people. are more productive. We are more productive as an economy than ever before. And but that means we need more less than workers. Four people. It's just that there are fewer jobs. The jobs that do exist now can have lower wages because of obvious reasons. A lot of people are looking for a small number of jobs. The wages go down. That has huge impacts on the middle class and ripples out from there. We're moving towards social collapse. I think this is going to happen all over the world, not just here. And it doesn't require the overthrow of the government. It just requires that you let it alone. 
it'll overthrow itself. If you control the media, you can calm people down, but if the majority keeps getting laid off, they don't have purchasing power, the system collapses. It doesn't work anymore. They invade. It's already happening. This country is already insoluble. Uh, they're going to have difficulty with national security, paying pension people. They spend far beyond what they already have. Now all they can do now is create debt, borrow more and more money from, from banks. We also want to show you a rather grim sign of our times. It's not far from here in Midtown Manhattan. The national debt has grown too large for the national debt clock. It went up back in 1989 when the nation's debt was less than three trillion dollars. The debt has been piling up so fast lately they had to drop the dollar sign to make room for an extra digit as the number turned over to more than ten trillion dollars now and counting every second. A whole new clock with two extra spaces will go up next year. The federal government is not allowed to print money. It's not allowed to lend money or get in the banking business. That is a privilege for bankers only. So what the government has to do if they want to build an Air Force, say, of 2,000 planes a month, they have to borrow money from a private lending institution, sign the dotted line, and if the war is lost or failed, the burden falls on the public to pay off that debt. We find ourselves and our social constructs in a transitional state, a matter of social evolution. If we want to make it through these turbulent times, we must be able to adapt to change. All things change, including our social systems. Albert Einstein stated, We cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Earth is still abundant with resources. Our practice of rationing resources through monetary control is no longer relevant and is actually counterproductive to our very survival. Today, we have highly advanced technologies, but our social and economic system has not kept up with our technological capabilities, which could otherwise easily create a world of abundance for all, free of servitude and debt. How can this be possible? There is not enough money to feed or house all people on this planet, let alone accomplish these more ambitious ends. But Earth has more than enough resources to meet the needs of all people, but only if managed intelligently. Jack Fresco envisions a solution that he calls a resource-based economy. It is a socio-economic system in which all goods and services are available to everyone without the use of money, barter, credit, debt, or servitude of any kind. It is unlike any social system that has gone before. Fresco arrived at this direction through 75 years of study and experimental research. A resource-based economy operates on the basis of available resources and makes those resources available to every human being on earth free of charge without a price tag. So we have today more than enough resources to build a far more advanced society. I'm not talking about limited handouts so people just get by. I'm talking about a very advanced civilization. We have the resources, we have the technology, all we have to do is apply it. One of the main aspects of the Venus Project is to eliminate scarcity. This is where the technology comes into play. Because if we set up a resource-based economy and some things are scarce, it, it won't work. If you set up a resource-based economy in, in a society that has no resources, it won't work. So today with our technology, we can make things available. We can eliminate scarcity. We can create an abundance. As long as we can create that abundance, that will eliminate greed and selfishness and a lot of crime and a lot of aberrant behavior. A social system can be designed so that all can live fully and constructively if the powers of science and technology are directed toward human and environmental concern and overcoming the artificial scarcities of our debt-based monetary systems. 
all people, regardless of political philosophy, social customs, or religious differences, ultimately depend upon the same resources, clean air and water, arable land, medical care, and a relevant education. I think if you pledge allegiance to the earth and everyone on it, that'd be the way to go for the future. The human species is a single family, and the world is home to everyone. Neither nations nor people can coexist separately any longer. No more separate nations. So anyone can go anywhere. Before the states joined together, they used to stake out their territory. They used to fight. They had militias. They would fight. This is our territory. Oh, no, you're intruding. When all the states joined together, the government worked out the lines of the states, and they agreed, and that was the end of territorial disputes. If you want the end of war, you must declare the earth common heritage. This has nothing to do with those who want to form an elite world order with themselves and large corporations in control and the rest of the world subservient to them. On the contrary, a global resource-based economy enables all people to reach their highest potential where they can thrive and grow in a society that works in their behalf, a society that protects and preserves the environment as well. One that understands that we are part of nature, not separate from it. Some question what would happen to incentive if needs were met without our having to work to attain them. The question assumes humans have no desires beyond basic needs. If that were true, there would be no inventors, writers, or teachers. People work with passion on the things that interest and challenge them. Let's enable all people to have the opportunity to partake in the greatest challenge one can have, improving our world for everyone. Individuality will be emphasized rather than uniformity. This social arrangement will generate a new incentive system that values the protection of the environment and social concern rather than the shallow, self-centered goals of wealth, property, and power. It does not call for uniformity. It absolutely calls for diversity. The more diverse people are, the more individuality. So we emphasize individuality, creativity, innovativeness. This is the essentials of the design. It is not a group of scientists telling people what to do, how to live, where to go, what to follow. Motivation and incentive exist when people have meaningful tasks. True growth and development occur when people are involved in creative, challenging, and constructive endeavors. However, motivation and incentive die in the daily grind of boring and repetitive jobs required to earn a paycheck. If you hand out things to people, if you fed them and clothed them and housed them free, they're not going to work in the morning because they don't need it. They got their housing, clothing, motion pictures, and entertainment. Well, why go to work? Work is painful. It's monotonous. It's boring. In the future, if, if people have access to all their needs, but they don't have any challenges, this is where it goes to pot. So people constantly are challenged by new things. In our schools, we challenge them with many things that are not solved, there are many unresolved problems. If you're well fed, well clothed, that doesn't stop your brain from working. That would mean that every millionaire does nothing and it's turned off because you got all the means. That's not true. There are many millionaires that work 18 hours a day and don't have enough time. It has to do with your background and your education. The more you know about oceanography, astronomy and all that, the more interest, the more alive you are. And if you're just given food, clothing and shelter, now you can go to work. You don't have to worry about making a living which your incentive would be boosted considerably. So I call that a new and innovative incentive system. Uh, it's not monetary oriented, it's problem solving oriented. And you get your kicks out of seeing the world become a better place. How can we use our technology wisely? So that there's more than enough for everyone. To achieve this, it's mandatory that the planning for it be based on the carrying capacity of the planet's resources. Our entire infrastructure must be redesigned and operated as coherent, 
integrated total systems. This means we must consider our entire global community as one unit that includes everyone and plan accordingly. Only in this way can we use our technology to overcome resource shortages, provide universal abundance, and protect the environment. Therefore, a global survey is first needed to assess exactly what we have. This would inventory our physical resources, personnel, production centers, and the needs of people. This enables us to determine the amount of goods and services needed. For instance, where is the arable land to grow crops? How many people are in various locations? And what is the state of their health? This would determine where hospitals are built and how many. If you try to do that today, ask for global resource survey of all nations, they'd wonder, what are you trying to do that for? To find if we got enough resource to fight you in armaments and other things? They would be skeptical, hesitant to give that information. So I would say it wouldn't work in today's culture. But after the ideas are put forth and the reason for it and the advantages gained by all the nations, it would have to be specific advantages that they could understand in their terms. And if they agree, then the survey would be conducted. It's not my opinion or the opinion of anyone else would be used. It's the size of the population, the availability of resources, the carrying capacity of the earth that determines what is done and how fast things move. See, today it's done on a totally different basis. But in the future, it'll all be based on a form of dynamic equilibrium. That means operating everything at the highest potential without environmental neglect. The key to achieving abundance and a high standard of living for all is to automate as much as possible in the shortest period of time. But during the transition we have to bring together the technological capabilities of people working with computers and working with technology and building and designing methods of delivering these resources and the necessary industrial plants to process the resources. Our problems and their solutions are technical, not political. Most problems can be solved when technology and the methods of science are used to serve all people, not just a select few. But what is it that you want? You have to ask, I want to live in a world where I don't have to fear that my children will go into another war, where there'll be deprivation or problems or disease. Do you know how to build that kind of world? No, I don't. Well, how do you go about the You call upon the various divisions of science, bring them together, and say, these are the problems we'd like to solve. A scientific government doesn't mean that scientists rule or control people. It means they have better means for building transportation systems, better means for cleaning the air. They have the best means for restoring the ocean that we know of to this day. Computers can serve the needs of everyone when cybernation is ultimately integrated into all aspects of this new and dynamic culture. One can think of this as an electronic nervous system extending into all areas of the social complex. Their function would be to coordinate a balance between production and distribution, assuring there are no shortages or overruns. In this highly technical society, decisions are based on direct environmental, human, and industrial feedback. You can think of this as electrical sensors throughout the entire environment, from cities, factories, warehouses, distribution centers, transportation networks, all over the globe gathering data for more appropriate decisions. The decisions are based on the needs of society rather than corporate or private interests. It is not automated technology or machines we should be wary of, but the abuse and misuse of technology by selfish interests. Remember, it is people who decide what ends the machines will serve. If technology does not liberate all people for the pursuit of higher aspirations and human achievement, then all its technological potential will